The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister John Dale. Our study today will deal with step four as we look at our series of steps in leading to life in Christ in a more effective way. By way of review, we remember that step one said, I need help. Step two said, my help comes from the Lord. And step three said, surrender leads to serenity. If we can recognize the sincere need for help, I have sinned, all have sinned, Everybody needs help, but I need help. I'm part of the everybody. And then I recognize that the help I need comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. When I can come to that conclusion, then part three, step three, tells me that I yield to him who can help me. It involves conversion. It involves commitment of the heart and life. And it involves a continuing surrender on a daily basis, but it takes that initial surrender fully committed to the Lord. And it, it is important to come to that point, that cathartic point that says, I'm turning from sin, I'm turning to the Lord. This is the time, and I'm not turning back. I may stumble along the way, and I'm sure I will, but the point I'm making is my effort, my commitment is not to stumble. My commitment is to walk in the light, and with the strength of the Lord, I believe I can be successful. That brings us to today's study that allows us to see in step four a personal inventory that can be taken now that I truly belong to the Lord. I want to be personal as I study me and my needs, my strengths, my weaknesses, all the things that go to make me who I am. The scripture basis for this is from Lamentations in the Old Testament. Chapter 3 at verse 40, let us search out and examine our ways. Uh, simply a pivotal springboard verse from which to look at the rest of the lesson. As we look at personal inventory, we're investigating strengths, weaknesses, and behaviors. It's easy for me to look at your perceived strengths or weaknesses or behaviors, I could be very critical of you if you do things that are different from what I think you should. You can do that to me, and we can spend our lives doing it to each other and never really gain a great deal out of it. Or we can stop so much of that looking around, especially if it involves harsh judging of other people, but to stop so much of that and look inwardly to see what our needs are now that we are children of God, now that we have recognized in step one that we are helpless, powerless to solve our problems, and we know what some of them are already. We know who the helper is, and that's the Lord. And we've made that commitment to Him in our hearts and our lives. We've sealed it in obedience to His gospel. We actually belong to the Lord now. We're true children of God, born again into the family of God. But we don't stop there. We actually officially start there. That's the beginning of the race. So now it's time for us to run with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. So what we want to do is to recognize that as I look at my strengths and weaknesses and behaviors, I'm searching my own heart. I realize that the key to it is honesty because I can be honest with me even if I'm not ready to be honest with you yet. How much should we tell other people about our strengths and weaknesses and behaviors? If you ask 10 different people, you may get... Ten different slants and answers on that. I received an email this past week from a man who is a professional counselor, by the way. And he was just asking what my general practice is in encouraging people to tell all. 
I'll just tell you what I told him. Tell all is usually something dangerous and regretted later unless it is in a very respected, confidential atmosphere in which it won't come back to bite you. There are counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists who've written books who will say, if you're going to do any good, you have to lay everything out in complete detail and total honesty on the table, and then it can be processed. I think on paper I would agree to that. Theoretically, I would agree to that. But in practice, I've seen it so many times backfire because the people to whom the person told all couldn't handle it, couldn't be trusted. Are there times when all now needs to be told? Yes. But generally speaking, people generally don't handle information well unless they are trained and competent and committed to the Lord and trustworthy and the populace generally is not in that category. And so what we're looking at today is not whom should I tell. We're starting with this by saying, I need to tell me. God already knows. And I already know, so why don't I just come clean with myself? Why don't I just tell myself the truth, maybe for a change, and identify my areas of strength, my areas of weakness or challenge or growth areas, as they're called sometimes, and the behaviors that I notice in myself that I can address, I can change, or at least I can deal with them. I can admit they're there. And when I come to admit them and come to see them and maybe to see them in reverse, I can handle them better and more materially if I'm honest in this search. So the personal inventory is not an easy task, but it is one deserving your attention and mine when it comes to absolute and total honesty with self and with God. And so personal inventory now with self. First of all, I must learn that I must personally be responsible for my own inventory and no one else's inventory. That is, I'm looking at me. I'm looking into my heart. I'm not responsible to look into your heart and to learn everything about you and every detail about you. Life's too short for that. And it could be that I wouldn't handle it well because of my immaturity or my lack of spirituality. So you're not really under consideration in this. I am. And as you read it and study it, you are it. You're on trial. You're on target right now with you. Personal inventory, as far as you're reading it and applying it, it applies to you and you alone. As far as I'm reading it and applying it, it's to me and to me alone. Personal inventory. I'm not responsible for somebody else's inventory. Now, these passages would be 1 Corinthians 11, let a man examine himself. 2 Corinthians 5, I must answer before the Lord, verse 10, that each one may receive the deeds done in the body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Here's the point. I examine me. When I take the Lord's Supper, as I did this morning, uh, I, I love to, to be near my grandchildren. But, I came to worship God if I focus all of my attention by choice on them and what they're doing and how cute I think they are and all that. I'm missing the point of worship at that time. Therefore, and those who have dealt with children any time in your life, you realize that you have to keep one eye open to see what the child is doing and keep the other eye closed in prayer or whatever you do that. And it's not easy, and those are hard years to get spiritually where you want to be. Uh, the Lord helps you get through them, and you do actually get through them. But it has to take time and focus and energy in order to examine self and worship personally and individually, even though large numbers around you may be worshiping or they may not be. Again, that's not your problem. The focus is at that point on personal 
inventory, interrogation, examination. So let a man examine himself and then eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Because he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks condemnation to himself, judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The second, I must learn that along with all other persons, I have definite areas of strength and definite areas of weakness. I do and you do. We do, but the point now is I'm addressing mine. What are my areas of strength? No bragging, simply taking an inventory. What are my areas of weakness? No effort at being depressed, but being honest and seeing I don't have it together all the time. I don't do everything exactly right all the time. I don't say things as I should all the time. I don't carry my life and my weight, my load, my responsibilities in my job, in my family. I don't get it right all the time. And so I need to address the fact that I do have weaknesses and I do have strengths. And I do need to address them with honesty and personal examination and inventory. If I can do that, I'm going to make some real strides toward improvement at least later on and hopefully slow improvement all along. The passages from Isaiah 53, from Romans 12, and from 1 Corinthians 12. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. All have sinned, have come short of the glory of God. But Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 would say, we all can do some things. We're parts of the body. And therefore, we find the areas where we can serve and serve well. And we emphasize those and we allow ourselves to be used of the Lord and of the church and of our family in ways that are in our category, down our line. We were talking yesterday at home. Uh, Marsha will be leaving Thursday to go for two weeks, a little over two weeks, to Ukraine. And we were talking about the uh, cooking at our house. Uh, it will come to an abrupt halt come Thursday as far as the cooking in the house is concerned because I don't cook. Uh, I, I could on some things, I think, but I don't want to. I don't enjoy it. I'm not good at it. I've had little experience. I wasn't good at it, and I quit it. And so I don't plan to do any cooking much. Uh, if she comes back and I've lost 20 or 30 pounds, she'll say, boy, how'd you do it? And I say, well, I didn't eat nothing. Uh, I could say a lot of things, but I won't. What I'm saying is this. I don't emphasize that in my life, but my son does. He likes to cook. He enjoys it. He gets off from work and will cook and can and just do lots of things. That's fine. It's fine if you do. It's fine if you don't. But I dare say that everybody in this room, everybody has an area of interest and emphasis that is particularly enjoyable and you're adept at it and you find yourself wanting to do that more because it's something that you feel you can do. And I also am willing to guess that 100% of us would have an area or more than one area where we just avoid it, we let somebody else do it, or it just doesn't get done because we just don't find it fulfilling at all. And I also would imagine that there are some things that we don't find very fulfilling we have to do anyway. We just have to do them. Just get it over with early in the day if you can. But the issue is I have areas of strength and I have areas of weakness you do too, so I need to learn to identify them and to find my place in the body, and the body is the church. So I can do some things in the church, but there are other things I can't do. To stretch a little occasionally and branch into other areas, that's healthy. Learn to do some things. Challenge yourself. Pride yourself to get out of your comfort zone and go ahead, but realize that not everybody is going to be an elder in the church of Christ. It's fine not to be an elder. It's fine to be an elder. But elders don't compete with the rest of us who are not elders. Deacons, 
That's a specialized area of service and leadership. It has a strong physical emphasis where the elders would be more in the shepherding and spiritual role of emphasis. But the point is, there's room for an elder, there's room for a deacon, there's room for a preacher, there's room for a teacher, there's room for members who do other things, there's room for the rank and file membership who don't have titles, who don't get paid, but are still serving and serving faithfully with no sense of competition or jealousy. There's where a united body working together functions for the glory of the head. That's what the church is supposed to be at the local level, and that's what churches should be at the universal level who have Christ as our head. And so we're looking for unique avenues of personal application to this inventory. Number three, I must learn that the success of the identification of these strength and weakness areas is dependent upon my willingness to admit that they exist and upon my honesty in recognizing and acknowledging them. Back in the Old Testament book of Job, we find, for instance, where Job said in, in Job 31, 6, let me be weighed in a just balance that God may know my integrity. And then we come to 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, or rather to Luke chapter 15, and we find where the prodigal son says, I will arise and go to my father. I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he went. And he said when he got there, Father, I've sinned against heaven and so forth. And the father seemed to interrupt his speech and to give him a robe and a ring and so forth. The point was this young man was willing to say, I have done wrong and in my honesty I'm recognizing and acknowledging it. If I don't come to that point spiritually somewhere in my development, I'm not going to make it. It's not self-degradation. We're not talking about mutilation, but we're talking about honesty and humility and openness and a willingness to say, I'm the one who has caused this problem. Others may have contributed to it, but I can't confess their sins. I can't deal with their sins. I'm dealing with mine. I have to admit my flaws. And when I can admit mine, then I can work on them and maybe help you with yours. But as long as I'm blaming you or blaming my childhood or blaming somebody and everybody and anybody, then I'm not going to address it well and nobody's going to find any relief for me. It's just not there. Childhood is very important. Genetics, even before that, the genetic factor is important. The environmental factor is important. That has to be weighed into the total picture. But somewhere along the way, having addressed genetics, having addressed environment and influence, I come to the point of addressing volition. I address choices that I make based upon personal reasoned choice on my part. I either did it right or I did it wrong. If I did it wrong, I need to see what was wrong and correct it rather than go back and say, well, genetically, this is the way my great-grandparents were and my grandparents were and my parents were and here I am. Well, that has to be factored into the big picture, but that can't explain things fully. If we we're going to find repentance from sin, we're going to have to see that sin is a choice to violate the will of God. And the choice has to be addressed. And so I must learn that the success of the identification of these strength and weakness areas is dependent upon my willingness to admit that they exist and upon my honesty in recognizing and acknowledging them. And then number four, I must learn that denial is the antithesis of personal investigation and inventory. And that denial may take the form of minimizing, blaming, excusing, generalizing, dodging, or even attacking. If someone were to come to you and say, I want to point out to you an area of 
sin in your life. And I do it in love. I just want you to know that I am coming to you with loving rebuke. Unless you have thought it through and decided how you're going to respond, one of the easiest things to do is to respond with an attack on the one who came to you. Ah, yeah, I may have done something wrong, but I remember when you were in high school. And then you take in and tear them to pieces, pull them to shreds. And before long, you think you won. And the truth is, nobody won. And the person who came to you in love may be discouraged to where that doesn't happen much anymore. We have to somewhere along the way realize that when I'm dealing with this, I don't minimize it by saying, well, everybody sins. I do, you do. Why don't we just forget it and you do yours and I'll do mine? We can't reason that way and still see Jesus on the cross shedding His blood, suffering the rejection of the Holy Father. We can't take sin lightly, including our own sins. So we don't want to minimize the importance of the flaws in our lives, even though we do admit and, and read in the Bible that all have sinned. It's, it is a universal problem among accountable people, but it doesn't justify our having done it. Here's a person who has been unfaithful to his wife. And he says, after he's confronted with it, uh, well, okay, but you just don't know what a rotten wife she is. That's the standard answer. When men go to school, learn, when boys go to school, learn how to be men, somewhere along the way, they must learn that in a class. That if you do something wrong, blame your wife. Sometimes wives do the same thing. If something goes wrong, You've made a bad choice. You've misbehaved. Blame your husband. It's not fair. There may be some truth in the accusations. But the point is not you've been worse than I have or here's why I did it. It's your fault. The truth is somewhere in there, I have sinned. And if I don't come to that point, it's not going to matter whom I blame. Parents are a good target. Well, yeah, I did wrong, but you just don't realize how, how abrasive my parents were with me. You can't condone abrasive parents, but you can finally grow up to where you take responsibility for your own actions and attitudes. And so there has to be something other than blaming, something other than rationalizing, something other than dealing with it in a way that is dodging the point. The point is, I need help. The Lord is the one who helps me. I surrender to the Lord. Now I'm looking to take a personal inventory, and when I see an area that is negative, I need to address it, and I need to admit it and not lie about it. The questions that I need to ponder, number one, why should I take a moral inventory of my strengths and weaknesses and behaviors. Romans chapter 1, Paul said, I'm debtor, both to the Greek and to the barbarian, to the wise and to the unwise, and all that is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. Paul saw himself as a debtor. Do I see myself as a debtor? Am I willing, as he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, to become all things to all men that I might by all means save some? Do I feel a strong sense of obligation to other people or am I still thinking the world revolves around me, my wants, my wishes, my whims? If I can realize how blessed I am from the Lord and show gratitude to Him from whom all blessings flow, then I can realize that He can take me and use me and He can forgive me and empower me for greater service. But what I'm going to have to do is to feel a sense of debt. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, especially at verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each one may receive the deeds done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. 
And Paul goes on to say, For the love of Christ constrains me or compels me. When I realize how blessed I am and, and how many people have loved me and sacrificed for my welfare, then I learn to say thank you and really mean it. I learn to appreciate even the little things of life. I don't mind telling you that from time to time, and it happens almost every week, I'm in contact either through email or on the phone or in person with preachers who are struggling with a lot of different things in their lives and in the churches where they serve. And I, I, I quit being surprised a long time ago at some of the stuff that can happen. But when I, I hear some of those stories, I just come back home thinking, we have snags and problems around here every once in a while, but dear me, we don't have stuff like that. If we do, I don't know it. And some of it I would know. I'm just so thankful that we don't have such undercurrents and such pettiness on so many issues that keep something going all the time to hamper the work. I'm grateful for that, that we don't. But even when we have some issues and problems that come up, and, and any church does, and any individual will, we can learn to address it and we can take this moral inventory because it's good for us. It's for our benefit. It's for the glory of God. It's for the strengthening of the body, for the strengthening of the family. It's healthy to be grateful and to know why. The love of Christ constrains me. I am debtor. I've been blessed. People have given. People have sacrificed. People have been good to me. And so what should I do? I should learn from that to be grateful and then be a channel through whom those blessings are shared with other people. To pass it on rather than hoard it up and to allow it to be a springboard for gratitude and a springboard for greater service. The second question I must ponder, am I able to relate this step to the previous three steps, especially to step one? Am I able to relate this step, the personal inventory step, identification and acknowledgement of my strengths and my weaknesses and my behaviors. Can I take this one and identify with the other three steps? Is it an isolated incident of inventory or is it part of a mixture of things that will help me be a better person down the road? Hopefully I'm looking at it materially to where I can actually become better for having had the experience and I'm willing to honestly look at it so that it's going to benefit me and it's going to help me benefit you. It's the golden rule with some foundation. I'm building a better me so that I can help you by sharing more of what I acknowledge that I have by way of blessings from God. And so can I relate this to number one? Remember number one was I need help. I'm out of control in some areas. I'm not managing some things well. Whatever addictive behaviors I may find, whatever personality traits that I have just bluffed in the past, I, I've, I've just said, well, that's the way I am. I, I'm now addressing the fact that I can change. I can be better than that. I don't have to keep on doing those things because conversion can be real and conversion can be continual. Renewal of that commitment on a daily basis. And so rather than find fault and find fault and find fault with other people and stay unhappy and negative, I've decided not to try to find fault with everybody but to identify my faults and not stay there but to address them and to let the Lord forgive me and empower me for greater strength in those areas so that I'm better off. And when I'm better off, my family's better off. And when my family and I are better off, the church of which we're part is better off. The neighborhood is better off. The whole society is better off. 
the school systems that I might be working in or have children in or involved in some way, they're better off because I have a commitment to the Lord that I'm living out even outside the church building, outside the, the formal setting of religion. I'm putting it into practice at the post office and at the restaurant and at the bank and everywhere else I go. When I learn to think that way, I become a better person and I become part of a better group. And then last, the question to ponder, number three, what are my behaviors, strengths and weaknesses in these areas? Emotional, spiritual, moral, relational, intellectual, self-care and nurturing. What can I do, what do I have the tools to use to help myself be stronger emotionally? What about you? Is there something that I can do or something that I can learn to do that would be helpful? Look what King David said in Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, what we're doing here is not only making a personal search, we're asking God to search our hearts. Not to search our bank accounts. That's easy enough to do. But to search our hearts. Not to search our cell phone records. Well, that's easy enough to do. But that's physical, that's definable, that's tangible. We're asking God to search our hearts. We're asking God to search us from within our, our spiritual and moral internal makeup so that we can have those internal things channeled to the glory of God. Galatians chapter 6 would say, I'm trying to be spiritual and to help others and I'm going to help them bear their burdens. But actually, verse 5 says, each one shall bear his own load, his own responsibility. So I'm not asking you to do this for me. I'm asking the Lord to help me do it for myself. I need to check my emotional health. You have to check yours. Well, what do you do if you find something that you don't like? Then you address it, perhaps professionally if necessary but you address it because you've been able to identify it. If you don't diagnose what's wrong, it's potluck on what medicine to take. But if you address what's wrong and you can take medication or therapy or you can do whatever needs to be done to address that subject, then help is on the way and hope is realized anew and the future is bright because that personal inventory brought me to an examination and an identification so that I can find help. The Lord is the one who helps me, yes. Surrender to Him, yes. Commitment and conversion, serenity, oh yes. But now, as a child of God, making that personal inventory so that I can improve on a daily basis. I didn't start the race to quit, I started the race to run. I've officially begun the race in step three. But now in step four, I'm trying to find the areas where I need to address my weaknesses and enhance my strengths and to modify my behaviors so that God gets the glory and I'll be a better servant of God as this race continues and comes to a conclusion. As you look at all those passages of Scripture, uh, it, it's fascinating as you think about James chapter 1, especially verses 19 and 20, because here's what I'm doing. I'm looking in my heart and I'm identifying my areas of strength and weakness. And as I do that, a soul is being saved from death and I'm hiding a multitude of sins. If a person is overtaken in a fault, if a person errs from the truth and can be turned around, 
by that personal inventory, even with help from other people. But the point is, there's a turnaround that's taking place. There's a stride of improvement out toward progress rather than sitting back and saying, life is a bummer. It's been rough for years. Probably not going to get any better. And the truth is, it's probably not going to get any better. Unless it's addressed and unless the Lord's help is sought. Therefore, we come to conclude by saying this. If I realize that this personal inventory is where I'm searching my heart while you search yours, whatever I find there, I thank God if it's good and I pray that He'll work in it if it's not good, then He can help me be better and do better. He'll get the glory. People around me will get the benefits and I'll get personal fulfillment out of it. Nobody lost except Satan. And God won and you won and I won. May he help us to do that to his glory. And thank you for being here. This has been It Is Written, a weekly exploration of the word of our living God with John Dale, minister of the Glendale Road Church of Christ. Please visit us online at www.glendaleroadchurch.org.